All right, if I could please have your attention, we're going to get started. If I could have your attention. Uh, my name is Johnny Burtka, and I am the president of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. For those of you that don't know, ISI was founded in 1953 by William F. Buckley Jr. to educate college students in the history and principles of the West and of America. And we do that today by hosting hundreds of events on campuses around the country, lectures, debates, seminars, um, and also uh, summer schools. And we also support uh, campus groups and independent campus newspapers like the Harvard Salient. Tonight we gather for, for the final debate in our Arthur N. Roop Foundation National Debate Series, which aims to foster free speech and intellectual inquiry on campuses across America. Before the 1960s, American colleges and universities greatly limited political speech by students, both on campus and off. Universities were places of scholarly inquiry, but not freewheeling political debate. The era of the civil rights movement and disputes over the Vietnam War changed that. Universities became places where most controversial national and global issues were debated openly and vigorously discussed. But in the decades since then, two new developments have placed limits on campus free speech. One is that universities have become so dominated by liberal viewpoints among faculty, administrators, and student activists that conservative students have sometimes been silenced. The other development has been the rise of the concept of hate speech, which deems the language that attacks people for their race, sex, creed, or other characteristics to be not only offensive, but harmful, even some say violent. The Hamas atrocities of October 7th, 2023, and Israel's subsequent war in Gaza have raised anew all the old questions of free speech and its limits on campus. Today's panel is an exercise in using free speech to understand its limits in the context of one of the most polarizing issues of our time. Please join me in welcoming Alex Hughes, Editor-in-Chief editor of the Harvard Salient, to introduce, our, the, to introduce this evening's speakers. Well, thank you, and thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, it is certainly our pleasure to be participating in this event. Uh, our first speaker, our debater, uh, Shadi Hamid, is a member of the Washington Post's editorial board and a professor of Islamic studies at Fuller Seminary and adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Previously, he was a longtime senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a contributing writer at The Atlantic. He received his doctorate in political science from Oxford, where he was a Marshall Scholar, and his next book, On Power, is due out next year. Randall Kennedy is the Michael R. Klein Professor at Harvard Law School, where he teaches courses on contracts, criminal law, and the regulation of race relations. He clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall and is a member of the Supreme Court Bar. Professor Kennedy has written a number of books and writes for a wide range of scholarly and general interest publications. He is a trustee emeritus at Princeton and a member of the Council on Academic Freedom at Harvard. Josh Hammer is senior editor at large at Newsweek a syndicated columnist, and the host of The Josh Hammer Show. He is also a research fellow with the Edmund Burke Foundation, a fellow with the Palm Beach Freedom Institute, and was a John Marshall Fellow with the Claremont Institute. Prior to Newsweek and The Daily Wire, where he was an editor, Hammer worked at Kirkland and Ellis and clerked for Judge James Ho of the Fifth Circuit. Arthur Millick is the executive director of the Claremont Institute's Center for the American Way of Life. Previously, he was the Associate Director of the Center for American Studies and AWC Family Foundation Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Prior to Heritage, he worked at the House Committee on Armed Services and at the Hudson Institute. He is the editor of Up From Conservatism, Revitalizing the Right After a Generation of Decay. And our moderator, Ross Douthat, is an opinion columnist at the New York Times. His column appears every Tuesday and Sunday, and he is also a host on the weekly podcast, Matter of Opinion. Previously, he was a senior editor at The Atlantic. Douthat is an alumnus of Harvard College and, I am proud to say, of The Salient, and he's the author of many books, including Bad Religion, How We Became a Nation of Heretics, and The Decadent Society. Please join me in welcoming all of our debaters. Who wants the right and who wants the left? All right, I'm, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna let all right. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. Thanks to everyone for being here tonight um, for what promises to be, I would say, 
a very interesting and provocative conversation. Um, it's also a slightly unusual format in that we are attempting to run a two-on-two uh, -two debate, which is obviously not unheard of, um, but presents its own unique challenges. So we're going to, uh, just, just so everyone is aware of how the format is going to work, um, we are going to have the gentleman to my right speak first in sequence, and then the gentleman to my left, five minutes each, so a total of roughly 20 minutes of remarks. Then everyone will be seated and remain seated and we'll have a period of, let's say, rebuttal and conversation, um, followed by a period of audience Q&A, followed by closing statements, which will be brief, two to three minutes, and for which we will alternate the two sides in some form that we will determine on the fly at that point in the conversation, if we've all survived that far. Um, and it's also an interesting debate in that we don't have a sort of single resolved where I can say this is the pro side and this is the con side, which I think reflects on the kind of unsettlement and uncertainty about what precisely we are debating in the wake of October 7th and in debates about free speech on campus. Um, and I just wanted, using my moderator's prerogative to sort of throw out three possible ideas of sort of what, what a resolve could be for a debate like this, which uh, our debaters should feel free to absolutely disregard and ignore, but I thought it might be useful as a framing device for the conversation. Um, I think you can imagine a world where we set a resolve for a debate like this along the lines of the aftermath of Hamas's attacks on October 7th have exposed a serious problem of anti-Semitism on college campuses. You could imagine a debate run along those lines arguing in effect that a lot of pro-Palestinian speech after the attacks crossed the line into anti-Semitism, revealed something about the tolerance of anti-Semitism on college campuses, and people could argue that that was true or people could argue that that was false or an overstatement. You could also imagine a debate along the lines of the aftermath of October 7th has exposed the hypocrisy of university attempts to regulate speech on college campuses, mm -hmm. uh, right? Where, uh, you know, essentially the idea would be that prior to Hamas's atrocities, there was a clear sense in which colleges were cracking down on free speech and policing free speech in all kinds of ways, but it seemed to work because colleges are mostly liberal institutions, so they always sort of knew who they were supposed to police and who they weren't supposed to police, and that the Hamas attacks created a dynamic where both sympathizers with Palestine and sympathizers with Israel had claims around free speech that universities suddenly found themselves incompetent to arbitrate between, and thus the sort of hypocrisy of the overall system of regulation was exposed. You could imagine a debate along those lines. Finally, you could imagine a debate arguing that college campuses are hostile to the free speech of Palestinians, uh, that took that as the resolve, took attempts to regulate and restrict speech uh, in defense of either Hamas or just in defense of Palestinian rights. There was an opinion column in my own newspaper making exactly this argument, I think, just within, within the last week, and that would obviously be sort of the mirror image of the first resolve. So anti-Semitism, university hypocrisy, uh, restrictions on pro-Palestinian speech, I think all of these ideas are sort of in the air around this conversation, and that concludes my intervention. And um, now I'm just going to turn it over to our participants and each of the gentlemen to my right will have five minutes to speak each and then each of the gentlemen to my left will do the same and then we'll mix it up. And thank you all again for being here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, ISI, first of all, for uh, inviting me and putting this on. Uh, thank you very much for all of those suggestive questions. They're all very interesting. Regrettably, I'm not going to take any of those suggestions. Um, and my goal here is to uh, try and make sense of why we even have this right, the freedom of speech, uh, and what proper limits uh, should be on it, uh, if there are such, and I think that there are. 
Uh, now, today, the freedom of speech means, I think, the opposite very frequently of what it should. Our public view, I think, is quite dangerous and comically confused. So we say things like the following. Pornography is speech. Burning a flag is speech. Absurdly, baking a cake is speech. Aggressive, intimidating protests, speech. Emoting hysterically, speech. We also say speech is violence, but sometimes even silence is violence. And when it comes to political, philosophical, scientific speech, uh, which I think is actually the core of what that right is about, uh, hate speech restrictions are demanded or in some settings already in place. So uh, on questions of, for example, I'll just name a few obvious ones, uh, immigration, family, gender, crime, issues concerning the public good that any free citizen should be open to deliberate on uh, are considered often hate speech. Now, I wanna bring us back a bit from this confusion. I wanna briefly lay out the three, very simple, I think you guys know them, arguments for why this is a right at all, why we have it. Uh, the first is that you belong to yourself, and as such, your mind belongs to you. Your opinions belong to you. Your speech belongs to you. It's in this classic liberal fashion a fundamental right. Uh, the second is that you cannot rule yourself. You cannot deliberate on the public good without the freedom of speech. But more interestingly, uh, for me anyways, this creates a certain kind of character that fits Republican citizenship. It creates a kind of openness to being persuaded <clears throat> and the habits of persuading others through arguments. And that develops a kind of patience, a kind of self-control, as opposed to other means that have historically existed always and will reemerge at some time. Namely, rather than persuading on the one hand and having this openness of soul of being persuaded by arguments, uh, the opposite is intimidation, force, and violence. I think that that uh, quality of soul, that openness, is exceedingly rare, almost never exists, takes many, many generations to create and can disappear uh, very quickly. Uh, this brings us to the third reason, which brings us to universities. Uh, there is a, a kind of hidden high reason that we have this right, and it's the freedom of the mind, which I think the liberal tradition from which our founders emerged uh, for them was uh, the highest, most sacred thing. Uh, to, uh, to be free for your mind to search for the truth in science, philosophy, religion. Um, and having a small place in what is an otherwise uh, mean-spirited, interested, self-interested world, namely universities, where the mind can rest and be free. It's the only place in democratic societies that provides that kind of thing. Uh, in part, to better the odds that uh, the freedom of speech will be used in these ways, uh, there was a tradition uh, that put up guardrails, that put up guardrails so that uh, speech would not uh, become cannibalizing, would not become self-destructive. And there were a couple of these that I think you guys should probably already know, but that you guys may be in need of reminding of. The first is obscenity. Uh, obscenity means cursing, obviously, but that's less important. What's more important is that there was a view that obscenity really has to do with cultivating prurient sexual desires, for example. The view was that a Republican people uh, should have some kind of, should have some chasteness about them. Uh, it also meant no uh, gratuitous violence. Gratuitous violence, which desensitizes people, makes them, uh, can make them inhuman, also uh, was uh, a category that banned certain kinds of text and speech. Uh, the second category is libel. This one still exists, obviously, it's been loosened, but it means that you don't have a right to just destroy falsely somebody's reputation. We still recognize that, and some people in this room may have been the victims of uh, false destruction of their reputation. Well, you have a right to your reputation, and other people uh, uh, can't just destroy it. Uh, the last category is seditious libel. And what that means is cultivating, this is a category that has gone away, but what it means is the cultivation of so much hatred for a Republican government that it cannot function uh, legitimately. Uh, and no nation, the view was, the, under, the underlying moral view was that no nation should tolerate its own self-destruction. 
Uh, these were reasonable guardrails that the founding, tr the founders and for many generations after that, believed were necessary for the freedom of speech to blossom. Uh, universities uh, are obviously part of that. Uh, universities are, uh, some are private, so they're subject to uh, different kinds of guardrails, but guardrails nonetheless. This debate, in a way, is a microcosm of those kinds of guardrails. There are moderators, there are speakers that are not interrupted, that can speak, exchange ideas. And the most important thing is, you know, in, in this odd way, the audience. That before the audience are presented a menu of views that open your soul to reasoning independently, to weighing the false and the true, the unjust and the just. The activation of that little spirit within us, that very rare little spirit that doesn't exist in a lot of places and has not existed in a lot of times, is the sacredness of what universities are about. And I think that uh, campus administrators, professor, especially administrators, have the power, the authority, and the duty to set the circumstance up so that debates are held in that way, in the spirit of uh, moving that rational part of us, as opposed to uh, intimidation, as opposed to the calls on your reason to submit itself to somebody else's opinions and judgments. Thank you. Thank you so much again to ISI and Johnny for organizing this, this wonderful event. So, you know, I guess the theme of the night so far is, is what are we actually debating? So I guess I'll give my own two, <laughs> two, two cents on that. So uh, the public discourse, which some of y'all may be familiar with, it's, a, it's an online journal affiliated with, with the Witherspoon Institute in Princeton, Princeton, New Jersey. So they just had an, an extended colloquy of, of interlocutors weigh in on the question basically that was addressed in the congressional testimony in early December by Claudine Gay and Liz McGill and Sally Kornbluth. It was Yoram Hazoni, Robbie George, and most recently Hadley Arcus earlier this month who were debating essentially the question that Claudine Gay and Liz McGill could not seem to answer as to whether calls for the genocide of the Jewish people on university campuses are past the line of permissible free speech. So that is the debate as I understand it. Um, so I am taking the position that Elise Stefanik, for lack of a better term, was correct in her exchange with Claudine Gay, and I understand, although obviously my interlocutors can define it however they wish, but I understand my interlocutors to be taking the Claudine Gay Liz McGill position. That is just my subjective uh, impression as to what we're debating here. So with all that said, um, you know, speaking of the public discourse, it's actually their founding editor, my friend Ryan Anderson, who likes to say that you have rights, whether they are positive rights, moral rights, natural rights, but you have rights only up to a point. And rights are necessarily circumscribed by the fundamental good that they serve and the overarching telos, the substantive overarching orientation to which those rights are ultimately oriented. So to give you just one concrete example of that, I'm a lawyer by background here, I happen to also be a big gun rights guy, and I, I very much value the Second Amendment, but when you look at the, at the word arms in the Second Amendment, which if you go back to dictionaries back at the time of the American founding, you'll see that arms refer to shoulder hoisted weapons. But having said that, there's no one in the right mind, the NRA, the Gun Owners of America, no one in the right mind would actually argue that you have an affirmative Second Amendment right to a surface to air missile to shoot down a 737. Because again, we understand intuitively that all rights necessarily exist to a point and they necessarily must be subservient to some sense of the goods to which they serve and this sense of telos. And to give you just, I think, another example as to how to view this paradigm, I would like to kind of analogize here the, the marketplace of ideas to the free market in economics itself. And specifically, I wanna just make a brief note here about antitrust. Antitrust law, which has kind of had a, a rejuvenated interest on, on the American right, especially in, in recent years, some people might think of antitrust as a regulation, a kind, of, kind of a functional equivalent to you know, a workplace enforcement when it comes to providing health care to their employees or, or minimum wage laws. A antitrust is not a regulation. Antitrust is actually a guardrail in place to make sure that the market actually works as a market. And by way of analogy there, I think that that exact paradigm is how you have to look at the so-called marketplace of ideas. There are, ne there are necessarily guardrails in place to make sure that free speech and freedom of inquiry, the likes of which Arthur has, I think, quite eloquently, eloquently defined, there have to be certain guardrails in place to make sure that we're actually achieving those actual desired ends. In other words, the so-called free speech absolutist position, the Claudine Gay, Liz McGill position, for lack of a better description, is actually paradoxical and ultimately self-defeating. 
And I, I, again, we're talking here, as Arthur said, about uh, guardrails against intimidation and harassment on campus. We're talking about intimidations uh, on the heckler's veto. You know, speaking of the heckler's veto, again, I, I was actually, uh, for a different organization, I was on campus at the University of Michigan back in November. I was speaking not on the speech question, but on the substantive question of the war in Gaza. And within three minutes of me opening my mouth to speak, you had probably 25 pro-Hamas students get up there and raise their hands, started coughing audibly loudly, started chanting, you know, free, free Palestine, river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. All, all these various slurs, and that went on for 35 to 40 minutes with administrators standing on the edge and doing absolutely nothing. Again, is that speech or is that in intimidation? Well, as a matter of constitutional law, the heckler's veto is not First Amendment protected speech, but that is very much the kind of, I think, intimidation and harassment tactics that we on our side of the resolution tonight are interested in trying to condemn here. So to just give you a, a, a couple of, of examples here as to what, so what we're talking about also in the aftermath of October 7th, here are just some, some, some very graphic examples of the kind of so-called speech that the Liz McGill, uh, Sally Kornbluth, uh, Claudine Gay position is actually defending. So at George Washington University, home to a large Jewish population, roughly 20% of the school, they projected, quote, glory to our martyrs on the side of an academic building. Similarly, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, there were chants, glory to the martyrs <coughs> by any means necessary. Impossible to understand this other than a glorification of violence and a call to incite hatred and, and perhaps even murder of Israelis, perhaps all Jews. At Cooper Union, you probably saw this video of the Jewish students literally locked in a school library. You had so-called pro-Palestinian protesters lock them in, banging on the doors outside, chanting, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Well, from what river and to what sea? I mean, you're talking here about the extermination of the Jews. We should not be mincing any words here. University of Washington, out, out in Washington State, intifada revolution, there is only one solution. First of all, there is only one solution, a not so subtle reference, of course, to Hitler and the Nazis and their so-called final solution. Intifada revolution itself, speaking of the first and second intifadas, which resulted in thousands and thousands of murdered Israelis in cold blood, the likes of which Hamas did yet again, on October 7th. Globalize the Intifada, long live the Intifada, frequent chants at Columbia University, at the University of Michigan, where I was shouted down. When Palestine is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. You had a Columbia University professor refer to what happened on October 7th as a, quote, awesome, stunning victory. Look, we are talking here uh, about whether or not so-called free speech ultimately accounts for naked, unabashed calls of the Jewish people, who of course suffered the most systematic genocide in all of recorded human history less than 100 years ago. And we're talking here about mostly actions, not necessarily speech itself. And I think a reasonable analogy to draw would say, would we also permit the burning of crosses on university campuses? The obvious answer to that is not. This is getting at Ross's hip hypocrisy point. So obviously what's good for the goose has to be good for the gander. We need to have legitimate prudential guardrails in place to make sure that we actually fulfill what the actual goal of free speech is, which is to arrive at the truth. Intimidation, harassment, and calls for genocide do not suffice for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to echo my uh, colleagues who've spoken previously in uh, expressing gratitude for the sponsors of this uh, occasion, making this forum available to me, making this forum available to all of us. Now, let's repeat the point of departure in light of the terrorist attacks on October 7th and the ensuing war in Gaza, what are the proper limits of speech on campus? There's the implication, perhaps, in this sentence that in light of what occurred on October 7th, the limits should, there should be different limits than before. Um, I don't think that that's well taken. There's going to be atrocities, there's going to be crises, there's going to be emergencies. There's, every week, every month, from some place, there's going to be horrible things that happen. The question is, in light of horror, in light of war, in light of misery, in light of all of the things that menace humankind, 
should we change our basic way of governing ourselves and governing university life in particular? And my response is, well, no. Um, there are, of course, limits on freedom of expression. There are time, place, and manner restrictions. So, uh, there are many students here. If you come to my class on contracts, we talk contracts. If you get up and start talking about astronomy or talking about the baseball game or talking about the you know, events in the Middle East, I'm gonna say, you know, leave. We're talking contracts here. So in the university setting, there are many rules that uh, govern uh, our expressiveness and that channel our expressiveness, and it seems to me that's perfectly proper. Even outside of the classroom, we have, again, various limits. If uh, in, in Harvard Square, right across the street, if the people started demonstrating at three o'clock in the morning, I think that the university officials would uh, object, and they would be right to object. You can, you know, you can demonstrate all you want during the day and you know, during the early evening, but at three o'clock in the morning when people are asleep, no, we're not gonna allow you to uh, stage a, a, a noisy demonstration. Again, time, place, and manner restrictions. And then as my colleague just stated earlier, there are substantive limits on, uh, on speech, uh, true threats, um, various sorts of fraud. Uh, there are a whole set of things, and there are, there, are, there are various sorts of speech that are criminal and therefore out of bounds. Now, Outside of those, however, outside of those limitations, at public universities, and again, my colleague who just spoke n noted that in the United States we have public universities and private universities. Public universities are governed directly by uh, the First Amendment uh, to the United States Constitution. And with respect to the First Amendment, with respect to the First Amendment, uh, the, the, the level of toleration is really quite extraordinary. It is exceptional in the world. So a moment ago, the question, for instance, of um, the question of genocide came up. Well, question, as a matter of the First Amendment, is it, is it permissible for somebody to champion genocide? Can someone in the United States of America be imprisoned, be prosecuted for some crime for directly, not indirectly, not hinting around at it, but can someone get up, maybe dressed in a brown uniform with a swastika on, can a person get up and champion genocide? And the answer is, the answer is, it all depends. Now, there were a lot of people who laughed at the college presidents and denounced the college presidents when the college president said, it all depends. The college presidents were correct. Yes, it all depends. Are we talking about someone getting up, maybe, again, you know, in, 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 in uh, uh, the common across the street, the public land, or go one more street over, Harvard Square, somebody gets up and just gives a disquisition talking about why they are a Nazi and championing National Socialism. It's grotesque awful, currently does American law penalize that if all they're doing is making an expression, is expressing themselves, saying that they would like to see genocide. 
As things currently stand under American law, that is permitted. Now, you might ask yourself, should it be permitted? It's not permitted in other places in the world, thoroughly decent societies. Maybe it ought not be permitted, but currently it is permitted, and there's a strong argument for that. One of the strongest arguments for that being a deep, and in my view, laudable distrust of government and the question of, you know, who's going to draw lines. Currently, currently, it's not enough. You can't, you, you, somebody is not in legal jeopardy if they are simply expressing uh, a, uh, a desire for genocide. They have to actually incite imminent lawless action. But the Supreme Court goes one step further. You have to also show that they would be likely to bring about imminent lawless action. Now, maybe you think that's giving freedom of expression too much leeway, and we could debate that. But as things currently stand, that's the way uh, it is. Now, let me just say briefly, in my view, in, in, since October 7th, there has been a lot of discussion about freedom of expression, and um, there have been a lot of uh, very disturbing things that have happened. There has been harassment. There has been assaults. There has been uh, the encroachment on classrooms and on libraries, and all of that, as far as I'm concerned, is awful. But in my view, there are two things that have happened that disturb me more. One, a congressional committee going after universities, private universities. The claim is that they are engaged in an investigation. Was it an investigation? Was it an investigation? They had, they had already determined what they were supposedly investigating. They had already come to the, with respect to Harvard, with respect to MIT, with respect to the University of Pennsylvania. Now, with respect to uh, Rutgers Law, at, uh, Law School, they had already come to the determination that there was rampant anti-Semitism and that these institutions weren't doing enough about it, and the, gover and these, this, and the uh, committee, the congressional committee, wanted to humiliate, wanted to embarrass, wanted to intimidate the university. Question. Do you think that an arm of the government should be engaged in that sort of activity? It, in, in my view, the answer is no. They were engaged in punishment through investigation, and they haven't, they haven't finished. It seems to me that the uh, acts of this committee represented a tremendous threat to freedom of expression, academic liberty, and the prerogatives of a private institution, all of which should trouble people, particularly people who view themselves as political conservatives, who over and over and over again suggest that we always need to keep our eyes on government overreaching. Quickly, second thing that has come up that I find particularly troubling, a lawsuit. There is a lawsuit that is pending against Harvard University and, my, and, and Harvard Law School. It's a lawsuit in which the plaintiffs claim that these institutions have violated federal law, Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act to be exact, by their toleration of anti-Semitic speech. Now, in this lawsuit, there is a line that says um, uh, anti-Zionism 
is itself anti-Semitic, which means that anti-Zionist arguments are anti-Semitic arguments, which are in violation of federal law. If that logic was to gain a foothold in American jurisprudence, that would mean a tremendous threat to intellectual freedom in America. And it seems to me, again, that we need to be very concerned uh, about that. And in my view, those two things are the, be, because they seek, because they seek the muscle of government, those two things are the things that are most upsetting to me with respect to freedom of expression in the aftermath of the uh, October 7th attacks and the ensuing controversy. Thank you all very much. Okay. So I'll just begin by saying something which I think should be obvious, but perhaps it's not. If we are committed to a principle, in this case, the principle of free speech, it should be able to withstand an act of terrorism. Otherwise, it's not really a principle. And what concerns me about what my two colleagues on the right here have offered up is that they are explicitly suggesting that we have speech codes or additional speech codes on campus. It's not a very popular opinion, so I give them props for making the case. We know that speech codes have a way of getting out of hand and moving away from the intent of those who originally proposed them. And this gets, I think, to a fundamental question about the guardrails that they are proposing. Who decides the limit? Ultimately, in the case of campuses, it's going to have to be university bureaucrats. And there is something quite surprising to me about two speakers who are well known on the right side of the political spectrum, essentially saying that we should give more power to basically university commissars to parse the words of students. I recall, uh, at least from Josh, pre-October 7th, for the whole period of the, woke, uh, the wokeness that we saw on campuses from 2016 going into 2020 and beyond, he and many others on the right, understandably and rightly, and I was on the same side on this, they were quite critical of the fact that left-wing activists and left-wing administrators on campus were restricting conservative speech or restricting speech that could be construed as being conservative or right-wing or supporting the Republican Party or Donald Trump. So there is a question here of inconsistency and incoherence. The very people who are so outspoken against cancel culture for four or five years all of a sudden have found a way to appreciate cancel culture. We have to be very clear, that is what is going on here. And it's quite disheartening to see so many of my former allies, we were all on the same side, the so-called anti-woke side, if we want to use that term, now are shifting their position. The problem here is that when, when it's, the principle here is that um, we have to be consistent because if university bureaucrats are supporting our own side, then we'll say, great, speech codes are good. But there's no guarantee that we're always going to be on the right side of that ledger. There will come a time where we'll be on the receiving end of it, and the speech codes will affect us if we're in the minority position. So that's the whole point of having a principle of free speech. We can't just shift our position 
because we're the ones in power who have the ability to impose our views on a particular issue. So now that the pro-Israel side is ascendant, and now that the pro-Israel side has been able to influence these campus debates, pro-Israel advocates now support free speech codes. We have a simpler alternative, we have a better alternative, which is, as my colleague Randall outlined, we have American law and the American Constitution and we have the First Amendment. And if it works for society, if it works for our politics, and I would suggest that it does because I'm a supporter of the First Amendment, there's no reason it shouldn't work for campus. So are we trying to carve out a campus exception here and how would that be justified? Now, of course I would agree with Josh that if Jewish students are being locked in a library, if students of, of any background are not able to access their education or go to class, if there is actually um, a physical threat, then that's one thing. But Josh very interestingly elides two different things, speech and action. We can talk about action, and obviously there are limits to what can happen on a campus. Again, if you're barring people's access to education. But if we're talking about words, I will repeat what many of us were repeating endlessly in 2020 during the George Floyd protests. Words are not violence. Violence is violence. So when people are now insisting that intifada, the mere use of an Arabic word, and I understand that a lot of Americans get a little bit jittery when they hear Arabic words. Understandable, you know, post 9-11, all of that. Intifada means uprising in Arabic. The root of the word actually means shaking off. That is what the word means. The first intifada, if we want to talk about history, was largely nonviolent and included mass protests, economic boycotts, and general strikes against the Israeli occupation. Were, were there acts of violence? Of course, every uprising Every anti-war movement has included acts of violence. Would we say that people who supported the anti-Vietnam protests shouldn't have done so because a minority resorted to violence? Or that the civil rights struggle to fight for the rights of black people in America was somehow inherently illegitimate because a minority used violence? Of course we wouldn't say that. But now we're applying that standard to the pro-Palestinian side um, when they protest. So what, let's be honest here, what we have here is a bit of snowflakery, to use that term, which, is, um, which has gone out of fashion, but perhaps it's worth bringing it back. Um, from the river to the sea, if you see that as a threat to your very being, toughen up. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Is that really what we're going to restrict speech over? We can't actually um, have people saying that without freaking out. What Josh wants to say is that this is a naked call for genocide against Jewish people. That's absurd on its face. Um, from the river to the sea, uh, Palestine will be free. I don't use it. I think it's offensive, potentially. I think it's insensitive. I think it's bad strategy for the pro-Palestine side of this debate. But uh, being offended is part of what it means to be on a college campus. What about Palestine being free in that territory automatically means that people are calling for the killing of Jews? That's such a logical leap that is simply unsupported. Genocide requires, generally, um, a demonstration of intent. A lot of these people who say it might not even know which river or which sea they're talking about. They might just be ignorant. They might be silly. They might be repeating what their friends are saying. Or they might be supporting a one-state solution, which is not genocide against the Jews. A one-state solution, from their perspective, would mean that everyone in Israel proper and in the occupied territories would live under one state, and it would be one person, one vote. Now, in practice, that might mean the Jews would have to live under an Arab majority, and Maybe living under an Arab majority is not very uh, appealing to a lot of people. It's not the same as being killed. Um, and again, words are not violence. 
So on the couple examples, as I begin to close here, as I wrap up, the couple examples that Josh brought up are not in any way obvious or clear examples of calling for genocide to start with, even if we wanna, and then of course, as, as my colleague Randall said, um, then even calls for genocide, it depends. But let's just, let's just even assume that people shouldn't be calling for genocide. Josh's examples don't really meet the threshold here. And lastly, I would say here, and this is really worth noting, if we take Josh and Arthur's approach to having guardrails on campus, they should be careful what they wish for because it could be turned against them. It could be turned against the pro-Israel side. Many Americans now, a growing number of Americans, uh, consider Israel's war in Gaza to be genocidal. Do we really wanna get in a situation where university bureaucrats are saying, well, hmm, this person supported Israel's war in Gaza. That is tantamount to supporting a genocide against the Palestinian people. That is now a mainstream position. We don't have to like it. We can say that's absurd, but it's something that we hear increasingly in mainstream debates around this issue here in America. So if you take that, if you take that premise, then speech codes are gonna be used against Josh because he has been a very fervent um, supporter of Israel's war in Gaza. Do we really wanna start setting this precedent where everyone is going to be saying that the other side is committing genocide against their side? That is the door that we're opening here. And um, I see no way to get around this. There is no neutral arbiter so what we have to do is err on the side of not having speech codes because we're never going to be able to come to a common understanding of what constitutes what. Let's have free and unfettered debate. That's actually why we're here tonight. Um, and I look forward to hearing what my colleagues on the right will have to say about that. Thank you. Do you want to go first? All right, so let's have some responses from the gentleman to my right to what we've just heard, and then maybe a brief response from the gentleman to my left, and then I'll try to ask a couple of pointed questions, and then we'll open it up to you. So uh, either Josh or Arthur, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I can hop in here. Um, all right, so there's a lot to respond to. I'll try to be as, as, as brief as possible because we want to get, obviously, to Ross's questions and then the audiences as well. Um, first of all, um, I, I, I uh, I'll start with uh, Professor Kennedy. Um, I, I wholly reject the premise that there is anything whatsoever to be worried about, about Congress using its subpoena power to call people to testify who represent private institutions for multiple reasons. One is that Harvard, like University of Pennsylvania and MIT, in the case of the December testimony, obviously takes federal taxpayer dollars. If you don't want to trot down to Washington, D.C., you should probably go the full Hillsdale College route and not take a penny of taxpayer dollars to begin with. Second of all, Again, using the subpoena power to call for private corporations or private entities people or CEOs or whatnot to appear in DC is probably one of the most common forms of congressional committee hearing going back at least 100, 150 years. I mean, I'm sure most of you have seen, you know, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg and all the, all the tech CEOs. We had a big hearing about TikTok where they were trotted in there. This is very, very, very standard practice there. There is nothing even remotely, I, th I think, icky or, or, or potentially problematic about this, at least at a, at a conceptual level. Um, and then finally, I guess the final reason why I'm not concerned about that is because Congress as an institution, as the legislature of the people, is ultimately tasked, as is our entire federal government per our preamble in the Constitution, with securing the common good. And if you are caring about the common good, you necessarily must care about the next generation of leaders, and many of those leaders come disproportionately from universities such as Harvard, Pennsylvania, and MIT. It is wholly and entirely within Harvard's purview to care about whether or not their leaders are failing to, condo to condone open calls for genocide on campus. So that's, that's my take on that. Um, to the take as to whether uh, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, yes, of course, it obviously is. This is the standard uh, IRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, includes anti-Zionism. Look, if you look at the founding of Israel in 1948, there are three basic ways well, how a nation can, can become independent. One is international treaty, two is indigeneity, three is war. And Israel literally meets all three. There are, in, there are international treaties about Israel's foundation. It, 
Obviously, the Jews are the indigenous people, going back thousands and thousands of years. There are, there is, no, no matter how many times UNESCO and the other moral idiots at Turtle Bay in the, United, in, the, in the United Nations might try to whitewash this fact, it remains the case that the Jews were there thousands of years before Muhammad was born. And then finally, when it comes to wars and uh, of conquest or defense, obviously in 1948, with the minutes of David Ben-Gurion declaring Israel's independence, you had Arab armies surrounding on all sides that invaded. Israel won that defensive war. It was not a war of choice, it was a defensive war. So they, they fit all three criteria. And denying to the Jewish people the right that any other people around the world is naturally accustomed to, whether it's the Italian people, the French people, or, or so forth, which is the inherent right to have a homeland in your ancient ancestral homeland, to have that double standard per Nathan Sharansky is also anti-Semitism. Now, moving on as well, uh, Shadi has unfortunately completely mischaracterized my position on speech. Perhaps he hasn't done the reading, perhaps he just is mistaken. Um, I am not a free speech absolutist, nor have I ever been. In fact, I wrote a column in 2021 entitled The Limit. I never said you were, just to be clear. Okay, but you, you, you were talking about my purported my, my, my purported fervor and zeal for railing against cancel culture. On the contrary, in 2021, I wrote a column entitled The Limits of Free Speech. About a year later, in January 2022, I wrote a column entitled The Limits of Appealing to Cancel Culture. Um, I have always believed that there must be guardrails in place in the so-called marketplace of ideas, the same way that there must be guardrails in place in any market to make that market actually functioning and not, as I was saying earlier, paradoxically actually self-defeating in, in, in the long run. Um, I, I, I had one more point, but I, I, I forgot it, so I'll stop there. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, there's something very funny that uh, all of a sudden, those representing the left are on the side of free speech. Uh, that is uh, a tradition that I think the left abandoned quite some time ago. Uh, and on this issue, suddenly the left has found its principled stance um, uh, just to clarify, we don't represent the left. We re represent enough. Shadi and Randall, and we've been outspoken and consistent on this for God knows how long. And I would challenge anyone to look at what we've said over the past 10 years and find differently. But we do, we are actually consistent on this issue. Fair enough. Unlike many others, yeah. All right. Uh, Professor, Professor Kennedy. Uh, I appreciate your comments, and I agree with you, actually. I don't want the federal government intervening either. Uh, the problem is it does on almost everything relentlessly in an unstoppable way. Um, just one example, uh, the federal government, the, e the federal EEOC, the state EEOCs constantly intervene in universities, in businesses, in all walks of life if there is a suspicion of discrimination or racism. Uh, those bureaucracies leverage a huge amount of power to the point that, I mean, as you know, all universities have changed the nature of their admissions, the nature of the things that they teach, how they adjudicate conflict on those grounds. Similarly, the federal government, as it's been revealed in the past couple of years, has had a very big hand in, you know, what's called big tech, but you know, the, the internet platforms that are the conduit of speech across the nation. So there's enormous intervention that I would disagree with, uh, that I wish wouldn't take place. I don't think that this is a, a, a unique circumstance, and I side with uh, my colleague Josh that no, there is actually a huge interest in ensuring that taxpayer dollars are being used to create sensible, well-rounded students. Uh, there's no question about that. On speech codes, I think that this has been addressed, but. In no way did I actually advertise speech codes. I said <coughs> a very simple thing, that I think that intimidation, forcefulness, harassment are actually an informal kind of speech code in themselves that compel people to think a certain way or scare them out of other positions. And what I was advocating for, and I think I made it clear, but I'm happy to repeat myself, is a circumstance where there are administrators in control of some kind of um, uh, template of neutrality, whereby there is thoughtfulness, there is the expression of positions, the argument out of positions, uh, and therefore to the benefit of the students such that they can think through these things without that kind of intimidation and harassment. That's not a speech code. I wanna ask. Professor Kennedy, to respond particularly on the question about 
the federal government's mm -hmm. interest in, let's say, the intellectual and ideological uh, climate at institutions that f have some kind of taxpayer support, which I think we can all, we can stipulate does apply to pri most private as well as public universities. Yes, and I think that's, a, I think that's, uh, we, we have a real issue here as to how we want to proceed. It's absolutely true that Harvard University, like many universities, gets a lot of uh, uh, federal money. Uh, question, how do we want to deal with that? Now, one way to go is to say, well, you know, you're getting federal money, and so, uh, you know, therefore, therefore what? Therefore, we get to look and see, you know, exactly what you're doing. Therefore, we get to dictate what you're doing. You, cl you could go that way. Another way you could go is to say, well, these institutions are getting federal funds. We understand that. We think as a matter of policy, it would be better to delegate to local institutions the wherewithal, the leeway, the freedom to use this money as they wish. Now, I've been in situations where people, I've said this before, and people have said to me, well, Kennedy, uh, you know, what about, what about um, racially discriminatory institutions? You know, un under those circumstances, don't you want the federal government to jump in? And my response is, maybe not. In fact, no. This is a big country, 300 million people, huge, you know, huge country, let a thousand flowers bloom. If this institution over here wants to go this way, let them. So I, I, mean, I think that this issue is a real big issue, and I think for private institutions, they're gonna have to really think about this hard. You mentioned Hillsdale. I think, it's, I, think that the, I think that the people at Harvard University should be asking themselves, uh, at what point do we turn down public funding? Are we willing to, are we willing to do anything for public funding? Maybe not. Maybe university officials are gonna have to come to the position that, well, you know, maybe we're just not going to be as big as we would like to be. We would like to be big, but that's, you know, that's expensive. We want to maintain our independence. If maintaining our independence means foregoing funds, maybe they have to think about that. But similarly, it seems to me that for the citizenry, we need to think, how much do we want to empower the federal government? And I don't think that we should empower the federal government to look under the hood of you know, um, uh, academic institutions. And you, know, you, you mentioned the public good. So what, do we want, uh, the, do we want uh, Congresswoman St St Stefanik to have a hearing on, well, geez, you know, your, your government department, it has a whole lot of, uh, you know, it has a whole lot of uh, uh, you know, courses on, what, I don't know, anarchism socialism, communism, we don't think that's a good thing for the raising of our citizens. Do we want that? Or do I think, we want... I think Arthur, Arthur might be. <laughs> oh, or, do we, or do we want uh, the local educational authorities to be in charge of determining the, you know, the curricula and the overall environment of our institutions? But there is likely to be and, and I, I appreciate your willingness to commit to the, you know, the, the hypothetical of the segregationist or racially mm -hmm. discriminatory school. But, but it is, I think, at some level, implausible to imagine a federal government that spends money on higher education that accepts, that, that sort of just accepts the First Amendment as the standard. Like, you're never going to have a world where Congress is going to sit by and allow, you know, Ohio State University to become an institution dedicated to the teaching of national socialism, right? Like there's, there's, there's going, just in terms of political realism, right? There's always gonna be a point where um, the government, you know, if the government is spending on public institutions, it's going to have some claim, whether it should ideally or not, right? I, yeah. 
Okay. Just, I just, yeah, just, that I, I may come back to that when I ask you guys another question. But let me, let me, let me turn to Do Tom. I get a, re a rebuttal? You, you can if you want. Yeah, I was trying to take control, but yes, go for it. Oh, yeah, just a, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a couple quick points. Yes. Just so we're all equal. We, yeah, yeah, you know, no, I, I believe That sort of equality. thing. <laughs> believe in equality at this stage yeah. of the debate. We'll see where it is. <laughs> Well, very quickly, I, I think that Arthur actually made an important point, and it's worth dwelling on. Um, many on the left uh, were not in favor of free speech for many years, pre-October 7th, and I totally take your point on that. So the question is, what do we do about that? Does that mean now mm -hmm. that the right says, oh, they never believed in free speech then, they're being hypocritical, so now we can just return to favor, and now that we have the power, we're going to, we're going to change our position too. I mean, two, I mean, this is very basic, but two wrongs don't make a right. Just because the left has been bad on free speech, that doesn't give license to the right to become bad on free speech too. That should be clear, I think. Um, and the other point I would make is anti-Zionism Anti-Zionism is not obviously or clearly anti-Semitism. If it was, we wouldn't have to debate it. It's not self-evident. That is something that should be up for discourse and people should debate. Oh, it, so what is anti-Zionism? What are different forms of anti-Zionism? Is it necessarily anti-Semitic? What do we mean by these terms? Do we use the IHRA definition for anti-Semitism or do we use a different one? That should not be preemptively closed as an avenue for debate. Josh is not a neutral arbiter. He has very strong feelings, as he just noted. He believes very clearly that anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism, but why should we take his word for it? So yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's sort of roughly the, the question I was, gonna <laughs> ra I was gonna raise to you, so I'll just let you respond. Um. Well, look, I, I think the idea of, you know, because we don't know it's obvious, therefore we should debate it, is profoundly circular reasoning, right? I mean, you have to have some sort of conception as to what anti-Semitism is. I mean, look, I mean, would the, would, would the slaveholders of antebellum period have, have recognized their treatment of the peculiar institution as racism? I have no idea, I, I, I mean, so I, I just don't think that that's particularly compelling, to be honest with you. Look, there are, and here's where, I'll, here's where I'll throw a bone to Claudine Gay and perhaps Professor Kennedy as well. There is a little bit of the context here, okay? Here, here's what I'll say on this. So there are some, and this is getting a little doctrinally in the weeds here, uh, there, there are some sects of Hasidic Judaism like Satmar that are doctrinally and theologically anti-Zionist insofar mm -hmm. as they firmly and unequivocally believe that a, a Jewish state should not be reestablished in Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, until the coming of Moshiach, the Jewish Messiah. Th this is different in kind, I, I would submit, than those who are running around college campuses wearing the kafiyas and chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, Israel is an illegitimate apartheid occupier, colonialist, you know, insert your leftist word salad of the day, state. Um, these are very different things, and there's a substantive distinction that anyone with even a modicum of common sense, I think, can distill there. And this notion of common sense I, I think is very important in general. So again, Arthur and I are, are, are not suggesting that there should be speech codes or anything like that. If you want to go up there and, you know, and, and have a debate as to whether you know, there should be a two-state solution, as to whether the West Bank should be independent or, or this or that, that's totally fair game there. What you can't do is to change the rules of the game such that it is no longer a free speech inquiry and it, has, and it is outright intimidation and harassment. So we can call that speech, we can call it action, but regardless, I think it's, it's outside of the lines. Okay, but so I think, I think we have agreement, I could be wrong, but I think we have agreement that, for instance, a crowd of pro-Palestinian protesters marching into this auditorium right now and making it impossible for your side of the debate to speak by shouting you down, that the administration well, we're not on Harvard property, but that, you know, if this, if this happened in a university setting, right, that the university would be well within its rights to prevent, you know, to sort of remove those protesters, subject them to disciplinary procedures, and so on. Do, does the pro-free speech side? Yes, not, 100%. I'm sorry, the, I don't want to speak. The, pro, for, yeah. the free speech, max, whatever, <laughs> see, again, we're falling into, anyway, so I, I think we have agreement on that. 
I guess my question is, suppose, to take your example, you have kafia wearing pro-Palestinian demonstrators running around campus, chanting, from the river to the sea, Palestine should be free, um, and, you know, bearing, bearing banners that, you know, that are, that express anti-Zionism in some, in some form, right? What should the administration of, of your university, your ideal Harvard or your ideal public university, you can do either one, what should they do? Should they do something to those protesters? They aren't, they're being disruptive in some gen generic protester type way, but they're not preventing anyone from speaking. They're not blocking Jewish students in a library. They're just expressing the ideas that you have described as anti-Semitic. What should happen? Yeah, there should be punishment for that action. I mean, again, my stance is that the chanting of so-called from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, is inherently anti-Semitic because right. anti-Zionism is inherently anti-Semitic. So there should be some punishment for that. Look, I, I, I You're want really, to- Are you being serious? What should the punishment be? You actually be? think there should be punishment for students saying- I don't know why you're so surprised by this. Because it's an absurd position. It's not an absurd position. <laughs> well, let's, it's, it's, right, it, let's, it's let's, a decidedly let's, anti, you don't believe in free speech. Maybe I, that's I, why I we're here. Do. I don't believe in openly, nakedly calling for- But that's- that's anti Okay, but so let's, let's, well, let's- That is calling for the genocide of any country. But it isn't genocide. I oppose, I, Shadi, I oppose calls for the, gen, for the genocide of the Jewish people the same way that I oppose genocide for the calls of your people. Oh, oh your like people, oh, no, is that no, no. how we're doing this? Okay, interesting. Can, can I jump in? I don't yes. actually even know what your people do, okay. but like, okay. Okay. people, Can I jump people, in? Go, go, go we, 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 I mean, let, let's test this out. Uh, at Harvard University, uh, I think it was about 20 years ago, there was an undergraduate who put up in her uh, dorm room, or actually in her window, a Confederate flag, a Confederate flag. And there were people, and it caused a tremendous controversy. There were people who said, you know, this, this, is, this is the flag of the slave power. And the question was, should the university make her take down the flag? There was a big controversy about it. The answer was no. No. Uh, flag stays. In my view, the university took the correct took the correct you know, position in stating that. And you know, now, do you th let me ask you this. Do you think that that was wrong? I, I think it would depend on the jury or the functional equivalent of the jury in the administration bureaucracy, but it definitely- You're the jury. No, I'm gonna say, do you, you're the president. It's in your power. Under the hypothetical, would you make the person take the flag down? Confederate flag. Okay. If I am judge, executioner, and juror, all the yeah. above? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so look, personally, I'm born Abraham Lincoln's birthday. I despise what that flag stands for, like, like truly. Um, now, the, the, the Confederate flag happens to be something that, I'm not a Southerner, I'm from New York originally, but I understand is a complicated symbol for a lot of people in the South, not necessarily because it invokes... I don't think that's the argument you should make. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm serious because I, I, think, I, I just think the, so you, I'm going to anticipate Shadi's comeback, well, and he's going to say said, that it, it, there may be genocidal so it's, people. It, it who, should, no, I'm anticipating your comeback. I would have no objection to the flag being taken down. I would have no objection to that. It, 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 okay. it's, a, it's a disgusting object. And I, I was supportive when South Carolina took it down in 2015 personally. So it's interesting, Josh, that you're willing to kind of have a lot of nuance for the Confederate flag saying that there's complicated symbolism and emotion, but when it comes to anything pro-Palestinian, there it's clear cut, and you're the one who decides what constitutes something unforgivable. I'm not the one who should decide. I mean, it just it should be because, a jury or people in charge who are able to adjudicate such matters. Let me let me ask. Okay, and, jo, I'm, how about Islamophobia? Okay, how about I wanna, this? Would I you wanna, punish no, students I'm, who? Wait, I'm 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 going to ask Josh a follow-up question, and then I'm going to ask you yep, sure. a question, and then I'll let you guys go back and forth again for a minute, and then we're going to take yep. Q and A. So my follow-up question is to take it in a slightly different direction and say, you issued a stirring defense of Israel's right to exist and its historical claims on the land of Israel. If you had a faculty member who was associated with the fairly commonplace left academic mm. critique of attack on Israel's founding, who was basically making sort of, I think what you would consider de facto anti-Zionist and therefore de facto anti-Semitic arguments about the inherent injustice 
of Israel's founding. And we can analogize it. We can say it's along the same academic, makes the same kind of arguments about the United States, as the United States is settler colonialism, right? And you know, both Israel and the United States are illegitimate states that should not exist. And indigenous people have a strong claim to the US, and Palestinians have a strong claim to the contemporary state of Israel. Is, they're not protesting. They are academics, right? They're making this argument in a classroom. Does that, to your mind, uh, under your definitions, become subject potentially to disciplinary action? I think it's potentially subject. I mean, a student under the Title VI interpretation that the Trump administration passed back in 2019, a student could potentially lob a Title VI lawsuit that this is anti-Semitism because the Trump administration adopted IRA as part of Title VI when it, when it comes to anti-Semitism and the definition thereof. Look, if, 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 let's take Harvard as an example because we're right here. If Harvard does not institutionally adopt IRA or anything like it, then the argument definitely is undermined a little bit there. But under at least the Trump administration's definition of Title VI, there would be a viable lawsuit there. Okay, Arthur, did you want to say anything before I go back and, and ask them a question? Well, if you want to continue on this theme, then you can. I, I was going to change it slightly. Okay, go, go ahead. I'm just going to check my... Clearly, we could spend three hours on this subject, so I just want to... Okay, so it's 8.17. We're trying to wrap around 8.40, right? So I'm going to try and pivot to questions within eight minutes. So Well, let me just ahead. make a yeah. very quick comment. You know, the, the, this debate is very much getting bogged down in what the title of the prompt is about, which is October 7th. Take, take a step back for a moment. Look, I don't think that, I don't think that it's a very big ask uh, to say that private universities, which are attempting, as I said before, to kindle that little sacred flame in us, can't say that almost all speech is permissible, except, let's say, the w categories that I talked about like libel, for example. You'd certainly agree that that's an easy one. But in addition, that calling for genocide, I take your arguments, just put that aside for a second. That calling for genocide is not quite the environment that fosters intellectual exploration. Moreover, it's very easy to argue about these things in the abstract without thinking through the psychology that goes into this. Because very quickly, what you end up producing are a lot of people, again, abstracting away from this particular debate. But what you end up producing very quickly is people that are full of hatred, at the extreme bloodlust. And if you've met such people, then you know there is a point at which a human being becomes beyond reason. That they're not subject to the laws of contradiction. They can't be stopped in that animating character that they have become. Again, I'm not talking about this political instance. I'm just, I, look, in, in a way I'm a hater of universities because I love them so much, you know, and I want them to be good. And I think that it's not a big step to say that, yeah, a whole slew of speech, of intellectual inquiry is accessible, with some exceptions, just like we have nationally, libel, seditious libel, obscenity, and the calling for genocide. Okay, but the problem is no one goes up and says, here's my statement, I am literally calling for genocide against X people. It never happens that way. There's always an interpretive process where people have to debate, wait, is this, what is this call? Is this a call for genocide? Does it show demonstrable intent? And again, what if a pro-Palestinian a pro-Palestinian ag ag advocate on campus, or really anywhere, says anyone who supports Israel's war in Gaza is supporting a genocide against the Palestinian people. And what if they call on university administrators to act accordingly? That's Josh's side. They would say that Josh supports genocide against Palestinians. The ultimate question here is who decides? And that's where I haven't gotten a clear answer from, from this side. And I would just add another question, Josh, if you want to address this. Do you think students on campus should be punished or disciplined for Islamophobic speech? 
if it rises to the level of calling for genocide, I, then, then yes. What if they consider Israel's support for the war, Israel's war in Gaza as constituting genocide? Okay, if you are supporting an allies war against a US designated foreign terrorist organization, which last I checked is what Hamas is, that is not supporting genocide. If you were to say, I want everyone in Gaza to die, that should be proscribed speech and that should be punished. There is, there, again, there are, there are reasonable distinctions that anyone with a modicum of common sense and decency should be able to adjudicate whether it goes to a jury or whether it's to the functional equivalent of a jury in an administrative bureaucracy. Can I, let, I'm, I'm now just gonna hmm. prod a tiny bit this way. So take something that is in between. I, I think we have um, overt literal calls for genocide. Every Gazan should be exterminated. We have categories like from the river to the sea, Palestine should be free, which Josh at least is interpreting as arguably genocidal, anti-Semitic, and you were saying obviously it's not or not necessarily and so on. Then you have the category of what you might call inc well, what you, of incitement, right? Which as Professor Kennedy suggested, you know, Incitement can't just be a sort of, you know, generic statement of support for Adolf Hitler, right? It has to be a statement that carries, you know, both a sort of call to violence and some sort of reasonable likelihood that that violence could actually take place. Okay, so take an example like the one cited by the gentleman to my right of students, I think at GW, right, putting, you know, glory, glory to our martyrs, glory to, martyrs. Glory to the martyrs, right? Like putting, putting that on a building. Now, I think a reasonable person could look at that and say, this is, not this is not a call for genocide, but it is an expression of support for the events of October 7th. Again, maybe, maybe you would just argue the other way, but I think you could imagine, maybe it's the t-shirts with the, the paragliders on them, right? Like you can, imagine, you can imagine clear statements of support, again, not per se for genocide, but for Hamas for some kind of violent struggle, not just a peaceful intifada, but the violent part of it, offered by students, right, on a university campus in wartime when such acts of violence were actually taking 